Um, okay, so the, the last segment is about predicting functional degradation, right? So we went through mapping, we went through a relationship between generalized and phenotype, general uh, properties of genetic creation. Uh, no, it is not on. One, two, three, one, two, three, it doesn't work. Um, so what the general properties of genetic variation relation to phenotype making genes, so now it's it's the, the very basic uh, properties of, of function, what, what actually happens at the level of micro function when, when you introduce variation. Uh, it's one lecture, uh, there is a lot in the field. So what I decided to do, I decided to take two segments. One is to talk about uh, missing mutations and proteins. So those variants that change amino acids at, at, at the protein level. And talk about non-coding regulatory variation. So I'm not going to talk about splicing. I wanted to. Uh, this morning I covered my slides, there's no chance. Uh, and I wanted to talk about uh, what, uh, estimation of the effect of loss of function variants, and I, I, I want to do that as well. So we can talk offline if any of you are interested. Okay. Moving to coding variants. Um, We'll start, I'll mention experimental techniques. Primarily, I'll be focusing on the computational prediction because this is, this is the topic of the school and this is what, what we're doing. And um, we started this, I believe, 20 years ago by now. It's, it's hard to say. I, it, it was a long time ago. Uh, so we started working on this problem, I think, alongside uh, maybe John Mould and Pauline Eng. Uh, looking at the possibility to predict whether the variant will significantly impact protein structure and function or, or, or it wouldn't. Yeah, the information uh, we were using was evolutionary information coming from the sequence alignment and structural information and information from the annotation. So the evolutionary information, now what, what we think about evolutionary information. So there, there's, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of methods, uh, very many, very new methods that have been relied on evolution. This is actually working, structure works uh, my, uh, uh, much less accurately, so structure doesn't work that well. Um, so what's happening here? Uh, there is the assumption that if I have a site, right, and I have a variant in a human, and I have look at other species, for example, here is dog and fish. Um, I assume that this pattern of amino acid changes and the rate of amino acid changes, so the, the rate um, with which emotion happens to the site, and the types of amino acids I see are stationary, right? So I assume that this other species are informative about the human condition. Generally, I'm making uh, an assumption in, in evolutionary terms, this is the assumption of constant weakness landscape, right? So uh, what I assume is that if certain amino acid is, is fine for human protein, doesn't change function of the human protein, doesn't kill function of the human protein, right? It's the same for dog and the fish, and if, if, if something is changing function of, of the fish protein, it changes function of the human protein. Uh, why is this assumption not fully correct? Uh, so one, uh, fish lives in a different environment. For some proteins, environment matters. If you don't know, fish lives on the water. Fish never gives five lectures in are like never. This is not what fish do. Okay? So humans are different from fish, right? The other thing is that there is epistatic interactions, what we call this not a dependencies, because fish has many other changes in the genome. And I'll show real fish experiments, you'll be able to see how it looks. And these changes in the genome introduce new context for this position, right? So I cannot look at this position alone because I'm uninformed by all other changes along the same. Now, if I make an assumption that this doesn't matter, and we'll talk how much it matters actually in, in reality, then I can look at the site and I can build a probabilistic model. And usually I don't have enough sequences, so what I have to do, I have to model uh, phylogeny. And because I don't have enough observations, I have to be Bayesian. So I have to introduce some idea of priors and, and, and all these all this usual Bayesian tricks. Uh, so that's the idea of using, using evolution. Uh, and I basically just said this, so I, yeah, you, can, you can read what I just said. Um, okay, the other source of information is protein function. And at some point, in many years ago, I think John Moll's group published um, the observation that most <coughs> disease mutations happening in proteins change protein stability rather than function. Right? 
And the reason for this is, is that mutation target or mutations changing stability is much greater. It's much easier to keep protein in a random place and make it unstable rather than change specific component of the function. So that sounds like great, but estimation of delta delta G, which is free energy of folding, the stability is very difficult, remains very difficult. So this whole problem is very hard. So far, uh, everybody is enthusiastic about the structure. Uh, helps. Again, not as fruitful as at least I had expected when we started working on this. Now you can go from sequence to structure, so that's almost a good point, but I, I think being motivated by structural properties of the sequence will still, will still help. Okay, this is now already 13 years back, uh, so this is the one of the version of our own software looking at multiple sequence alignment, trying to, uh, to think about distribution of amino acids and rate of evolution, uh, looking at properties of amino acids and things like structural effects like crystallographic B factor, for example, um, estimating mobility of the, of the, of the uh, amino acid. Uh, related uh, method, for example, SIFT is based purely on multiple sequence alignment. Roughly the same idea, different, different algorithm. Uh, it's a different way to treat phylogeny, a different way to treat priors. Uh, uh, and uh, I think I appeared the first version almost the same time as ours. Um, and then people started developing umbrella methods. So what, what the observation in the field is that you build these methods, you build classifiers, and they don't produce identical results. The observation is, even if they use the same data, to move and combine them in, into an umbrella method, right? So to, to take a method and, and feed many methods. So very popular method is CAD. And CAD is popular for uh, one smart idea. They take all variants of all types and put them on the same scale. So they can predict misances, but also nonsenses and encoding, and it's, it's very convenient to use. And the idea comes from the fact that what they do is they are uh, one class, so they have positive and unlabeled in machine learning terms uh, structure. So they are saying, okay, we have variants we observe, and we have a proxies, variants we simulate and then observe. Now, this is a very powerful idea. It also leads to a lot of issues, right? Because when you simulate, you're not capturing all the data. You're not capturing uh, intricacies of mutation rate, intricacies of selection, bias gene conversion, whatever other, other biological, uh, biological effects happening at the variation level. That's a popular method. So newer methods, it, this works actually pretty good. It's called REVEL. And REVEL is an umbrella method using uh, uh, random forest. Random forest is extension of decision trees. And decision trees everybody likes because the concept is very simple and they capture dependencies, but individual tree doesn't work very well. So what you can do, you, you, you can create multiple trees, trade them on the subset of data and, and, and let them vault. And that's what random forest is, and, and this is uh, reasonably popular method as well. Uh, I would mention this four. I would mention Verity, which is um, using gradient boosting, which is also a structure over, over decision trees, and specifically focusing on the known mutations and ultra-rare variants. There are multiple other methods. These are, these are mostly new. These are, uh, I still call them, so first, they, most of them are umbrella methods, so they feed a lot of methods into them. Second, I call them old school, old school because they don't use large language models, so they are not like ChatGPT, they are more like classic statistical techniques. And this is what, what the community is using the most. I think the, the type may be shifting, as, as I'll mention in a second. Okay, so what are the problems? Why can't you predict exactly? <clears throat> and I'd like to spend a little bit of time here because I discussed with some of you uh, some of the aspects yesterday. And I think this is important because I, I think a lot of method developers just don't understand what is the problem they try to solve. Sorry, now, it was not meant to be disrespectful about other developers, and I know you're reporting, so I take this back. <laughs> um, okay. So one issue, which is a very serious issue, is presence of weakly deleterious variation. So what I mean by that? If I look at comparative genomics, or if I train my model, <coughs> irrespective of comparative <coughs> genomics, on proteins that I see in the database, I trade on the variants that fix in the populations, that are, that are canonical variants in the population. 
if I have very small effect, uh, you have a mutation which is deleterious in evolutionary sense. It might change function very little. Natural selection is a very powerful force. So it cannot be a truly pathogenic variant or variant that really knows down function. So you would not guess a clinical presentation or experimental outcome outcome well. And this is I this is my old slide I decided to include it because we discussed it with some of you. So this is very classic stationary population genetics diffusion theory out of God knows what, 1960s. Um, and that's the equation for fixation probability. So this is the chance that a new mutation will be fixed in the population. I would observe it as, as a fixed variant uh, in everybody, as function of selection coefficients. So things what's uh, look what's happening. So this is relative to neutral. So this means that if my what is my selection coefficient? Selection coefficient is reduction in fitness. So this so 10 and minus 4 means that individuals with this variant have an average. Uh, 9,999 uh, progeny compared to individuals without mutation who would have 10,000. Right? So you, look, you lose one ten thousand of fitness due to this mutation. It's not a managenic disease. I mean, it's, not, it's not a serious effect. I mean, nobody really cares about this. However, evolution does. So what's happening is there is this change, which we call dream barrier in population genetics, at the point of reciprocal of effective population size, which is roughly 10,000 for historically for humans. So this means that if your selection coefficient is, is above this, this value, you're never going to fix the population, never ever. So it means that if I'm training the method on sequences I observe or on comparative genomics data, I don't have any resolution whether my mutation is real. <laughs> My mutation is 10 minus 3, effect on fitness of 10 minus 4. It's all indistinguishable. At the same time, if I'm below 10 minus 5, I'm neutral. Selection is not effective. I would see those variants all the time. Right? I just don't know. So the, the, the range where the whole game is, is very narrow. So the problem is that without population data, without estimating the effect, uh, from variants that are in the population rather than from, from sequences that fix or exist, we lose this dynamic range. We, we, cannot, uh, we cannot say anything. So that's problem number one, and that's an important problem to solve, and I don't think we have much progress, so we're, we're trying to move in this direction. I know some other groups uh, are trying to move in this direction. So the other problem is I told you about uh, dependencies between sites, or what we, what we call in evolution of genetics epistasis. This is from our paper with Alex and Toro from like 2002 or something like that. That was just a story. But I keep the slide for the following reason. Again, I don't know whether the inference is, is right here. I'll show you experimental data where, where I sure, I'm sure about the inference. Here, here I'm not. But this is what's happening. Uh, this is human beta hemoglobin. And at least the database says that mutating beta 20 for glutamic acid is a disease mutation, is a deleterious mutation that kills hemoglobin function. Now my problem is that if I look at comparative genomics, I go to the horse protein, and glutamic acid is here in the horse protein. Now what happened? Do I think that the horse has unfunctional hemoglobin? I mean, I look how a horse can run, and like how I can run, I mean, horse has, has everything is fine with the horse. Uh, now probably what's happening is that is that the second site, right? So glycine 69, this interaction is nice and, and, and good. It, in, in the horse version, it's histamine. It's probably protonated. We have a nice salt bridge potentially forming here. Okay, so there is you, you can only put glutamic acid on the horse background, you cannot put glutamic acid on the human background. Okay, so that's an issue. And if you look at the single site evolution, if you look at comparative genomics, there is no way for you to tell. So what we did, uh, and this is still a few years back, so this is a quick story. It's a page paper with um, my former graduate students in the lab, Daniel Jordan, and in collaboration with Lev of Nika Katsanis, uh, was, was published in Nature in 2015 or 2016, something like that. So we looked at a whole bunch of, of uh, mammals and, and general vertebrates. Oh, 
that's again moving to uh, moving to a different computer. Anyway, uh, so this is the observation. So for mutations that are annotated as pathogenic in human, potentially killing function of the human protein, about five percent, five six percent, are detected in mouse. Uh, now, some reviewers told us, oh, how are you sure about annotation, alignment, and stuff like that, so we read a whole bunch of literature. It's probably some of them may not be exactly correct, but majority are very bad. I mean, this is, this is a very solid observation. Uh, so what we postulated, that a lot of this is happening because of a different substitution in, uh, in the protein of the species. Right, so it's either happening in the human lineage, or, or is happening, or is happening uh, in the in the protective mutation happens um, in the lineage leading to this now. So Daniel wrote a simple statistical model, and we believe that within mammalian tree, that's usually a simple substitution. I didn't believe in that. I, I usually I, I believe in the model that there are multiple, right? So, like, multiple attacks that over stabilize the protein. Doesn't seem to be the case. It's a one compensation. If it's one compensation, we can find it, but we have to go and look at every single change that, that we predict and, and see if it works. And we decided to work with Nico because they had a zebrafish model and they, they, they can inject the embryo. And what's important about zebrafish model? We frequently know it's in cis because look what's happening. So we have, maybe I'll show this, I wouldn't go through, oh yeah, I can probably show, uh, go through this slide. This is, this is a uh, uh, model for one disease, it's, it's viral bill syndrome. Uh, there are many models in zebrafish, so the major story will be a different model, but this is, this is how the test works. Uh, so they look, this is the zebrafish embryo. I'm totally fascinated by the fish system. You never can guess what, what human phenotype is going to be modeled, right? So, bill, uh, viral bill syndrome, again, I, I don't really know details on the population, but it's it's also a uh, developmental delay. So the, this embryo is developed normally, but if you have small or larger increase in the angle here, this embryo is underdeveloped. And the believe is this model is human phenotype. So what you do, um, you look at the, at, at the embryo, and then you knock down the gene. So the fish gene, uh, like, like, like all the fish gene, gives you the phenotype. And then you take human mRNA and rescue it back. So you know human gene works on the fish background because you actually get the normal fish back by injecting human mRNA. And then the observation was the following, that this is the assay to test human mutation. You can put human mutated RNA, and it does not rescue. So this is how Nico's lab proves that these mutations are, are uh, pathogenic. <coughs> And you see this, this mutation actually reducing function of, 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 the, of the fish, uh, uh, reducing function of the protein and giving fish phenotype. The issue is that this human mutation is sometimes native variant in the fish. Do you follow? Right? So, so, what, so what I'm doing is I, I re uh, remove fish gene, I see the phenotype, I give it human mRNA, fish is fine. I give you a mutant mRNA and fish is not fine. But this mutant is the mutant existing on the, on the, on, on the native fish, fish original gene. So this means that there is something else in the sequence of the fish gene that enables this mutation to be okay in the fish, on the fish background and not okay in the human background, in the same fish system. So what we, what we, what we suggested is that we take for every gene and we would take uh, so when there's human gene with disease mutant, right? So that doesn't, doesn't produce the rescue. And then we can have a double mutant, right? And if there is no suppression of mutation, it doesn't produce the rescue. But if double mutant produces suppression, then the second mutation completely compensates for the first. So that's the strain. So the, the idea again, I take, I take a human gene, right? I know down the gene, I, get, I see phenotype. I, t I rescue phenotype with the human gene. I take human disease mutation, I see that it doesn't rescue. So human, uh, human mutation is pathogenic because it doesn't rescue fish phenotype here. And I take the second mutation, I take human gene with two mutations, and, and this is a bad functional protein. Okay? So we found a bunch of this. 
it's usually one or two changes. Uh, and interestingly enough, um, we would not be able to bring them structurally. These are very distant mutations. I have no idea how biochemistry works, but the effect is very good. Now, the interesting story is, uh, again, we're missing some information here. Uh, it's from Stefan from Geikas, uh, who, who ran the experiment. So there was a patient in the clinic that time uh, in North Carolina, or where the lab was, and she presented with multiple phenotypes. It was a clear de novo mutation, uh, and this gene was an obvious, uh, well, Tyson, nobody looks like compact heterozygous and Tyson, that's the longest gene in the genome that's false positive for every single analysis. Uh, but this gene makes all the sense, right? In this phenotype, it's a neural, neural gene. And uh, Nico's lab ran three different phenotyping assays, and they all work very fine. So we know that this gene is, is a causative gene. The issue is that if you look at the alignment, her mutation is very formitidin. So that's complete reversal to mammalian consensus. Every mammal but apes have methionine. So people didn't didn't believe this 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 variant, and what we show exper what Nikos lab showed experimentally, we take this methionine, right, uh, and we take some of the other mutations happening in in, in, in any of the species, right? I, I I think there are two in total. They completely rescue the effect of this mutation. So variant is actually pathogenic on the human background, is not pathogenic on, on any other mammal background. Uh, this was published, we were pretty confident, well, but you still have this nagging feeling. And two years ago, there was an email that people found two new <laughs> patients looking exactly like her with mutation the exact same together. So we know this story is true. Okay. So what's happening is why it's difficult to predict computationally, especially from comparing genomics to effect of mutation, two effects. One is I don't know about the scale of the effect because the observations don't tell me. The other one, there are correlations on the sequence that I, that I cannot analyze. Uh, there are new methods. Um, so we're working on the population level constraint measures. Uh, this is too early to present. And we hope that we can resolve the problem of distinguishing between strongly and weak deleterious mutations. And now there is booming of machine learning techniques. Um, they try to solve the problem of interactions because this is not the other learning, right? So, Ideally, large language models learn interactions. Bunch of methods. So, out of David Marx and our uh, David Marx lab, Fraser et al., um, a year and a half ago, this method Eve, and that's based on uh, <coughs> variational of encoder. For those of you who are computational machine learning application analysis, you probably love out encoders, everybody does. Um, and um, this method works uh, is sort of okay, so it's, um, <clears throat> it puts every, everything in this latent space and computes the model for the whole sequence, including every interaction. Uh, there are new developments, so this is very prepared. I found it in the bioarchive, I'm not sure the, uh, <laughs> the papers are out. Uh, so what's happening now, we have protein structure prediction. Right, so large language models are able to predict protein structures, and there are new methods. So one is coming from a company called Meta. Um, uh, some of my family members are using Facebook, so I know what the company is. So they, they, they generated this, this, this method. So what, what the observation is quite interesting, and I'm sorry for the quality, um, I, I should have just said this PDF. I think that's, that's, that was a mistake. I, I, I'm showing this part more. Um, it's, it's very nice in my laptop. So what's happening here, interestingly enough, is that looking at embeddings in language models, so they, you, you change the embeddings for an asset, and this works much better than running the full model and seeing the likelihood of, of, of structural change. I don't know why, but, but, but just in, in their results, is looking at embeddings is, 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 is working better. There are multiple efforts looking at alpha fold, right? So this is again because the structure prediction is not a physical method, it's not related to stability, it's not related to any physical property, it's very hard to do. But there is some progress in the methods and some people report uh, reasonable results. Again, if you look at this at this accuracy, it's, it's not close to 100 percent right? So it's still it's still way to go. Uh, I mentioned yesterday, so I'm somehow what became an author of this paper. So this comes from Aguna. Again, we discussed cloud computations with some of you. All these methods come from large companies because there is no money in academia to, to run any of this, right? 
Or oh, maybe I'm talking in American academia, there's no money. It's like the group around this, uh, this type of combination. Um, so this is done in collaboration, well, it's done by Carl Farr's group, and I somehow then ended up uh, on, the, on the project. So they first, because they are human, they, they sequence. They sequence our private species, and then this really helps. Um, and uh, they use transformers and autoencoders within the system. And they use uh, structural information and evolutionary information. So everything uh, goes into the sink. Uh, they report reasonable increase in accuracy. For example, this is all of the clean water data sets. So these are non-pathogenic mutations. These are unbiased. These are the novel mutations in DDD. So these are the novel mutations in one of the consortium, much larger, more successful consortium than what I show you. It's in the UK. Uh, it's about developmental disorders, so they show greater correlation uh, compared to uh, random for the normal mutations in, in autism. And, and again, if you look at the amount of increase compared to uh, standard methods, uh, some of this are developed originally many years ago. Uh, it, it's not a stunning improvement, right? It's not changed in the game, but that's definitely an improvement, and this is, this is where it feels more. This is just out in science together with other papers. Uh, the field's moving very fast because I cannot tell you about the papers I'm reviewing from those journals. Uh, but it's, it's more and more of the stuff is coming out. Uh, okay. Um, so this is roughly the state of the art in predicting effect of business mutations applications. One application is in Mendelian genetics. We discussed that I want to prioritize uh, important variants in the analysis I presented in, uh, at the last lecture. <coughs> and we also discussed this rare variant association studies burden test. And this is what people do. Again, the idea is that if I can focus on functional variants and ignore benign variants, my association test power goes up. Uh, and that's, that's quite clear. Even if I combine variants with vastly different effect sizes, if I combine real effect but weight them identically, this cuts down statistical power of the burden test, right? So that's probably relatively clear because I'm combining variants together to, uh, to, to draw statistics. Uh, this is on the Mendelian data set. So this is developmental disorder that's from private AI3D. Uh, you see the increase in observed expected ratio for missing changes in the NOVA, in the NOVA mutations in developmental disorders. And you see that if you run prediction compared to uh, no prediction, right, so the effect goes up quite a bit. They probably missed something because this is this is benign distances, and this synonymous provides exact control. Right, so that's observed expected is exactly one. And there is a little bit of inflation here. This is the effect of true nonsense mutations, right? So you, you so, so obviously these guys are not as bad as, as, as true nonsense. Uh, this is the UK biobank. This comes from Regeneron on sequencing in the UK biobank. And again, they show the value of predicting running shared tests between loss of function and predicted missances. They run pathway, uh, sorry, pipeline with four traditional methods. And this increases the signal. So that's, that's the major application of this in, in human genetics right now. Uh, experimentally. Uh, again, I mentioned yesterday deep mutational scanning. There is a lot of interest. It's a complicated proposition because you have to construct every mutant. You have to measure the functional effect uh, of every mutant. You need an assay specifically for, for, for a protein. And uh, that's roughly the whole idea. This specific one is for, for interaction. So you need a functional readout, right? If you have a complex, you have a functional readout. If you don't have a complex, you don't have a functional readout. Um, and you can measure this. So that's interesting because what these methods can do, what computational methods can, uh, because experimental methods are also noisy, right? So we're, we're probably in, this, in the state of the world where computational methods are competitive with respect to experimental methods. However, in this paper, this is in cell, I think it's this year, maybe it's last, uh, I think it's on the stage for this year. Um, so MC4R, uh, it's uh, a melacartin receptor, so that's a uh, classic gene for a childhood obesity, right? So people don't feel uh, that they fall. They, they, they can eat infinite amount of food and never get full. Right? So that's the issue with this, with this receptor. Uh, now, what they did is they looked at two functional readouts, and there are two observations here. So one thing, computational methods don't do well, 
they find gain of function mutations. A bunch of these are gain of functions. They are shown in this picture. When you look at this with your biochemical intuition, I have zero idea how to predict it. Right? So a lot of these gain of function variants are within transmembrane kinesis. I'm flying blind here. I, I will try it. I just don't know. Uh, another thing is that they measure two assays based on two functional readouts from the protein, and they don't produce identical result. And one is important for the phenotype, the other one is not. So what I know from this essay, I told you computationally, uh, because of the population genetics phenomenon and because of fixation and drip barriers, I don't know the scale of the effect. Here I do, because I measure it experimentally. I know direction of the effect, very difficult to do computationally. And I, I can measure different components, different types of function, because when I do computationally, I literally measure force of evolution, right? That's, that's, that's what's happening. Uh, by the way, so what's, what's interesting in this paper, they found that uh, loss of function mutations in the cohort in the UK biobank are associated with uh, increase in, in body mass, uh, but people with gain of function mutations are actually uh, linear, so they, they lose uh, body mass. Uh, so it's, I don't know what there will be a missing device for, for, for using this target, but this is, this is where we're going, right? You have to know the direction of the effect. Okay. This are coding mutations. How is anybody tracking time when we started? Uh, I have the whole. Unless I'm being stopped, I'm, I keep going, okay? Like, I, I keep going. If, if you're tired and you're in need of coffee or something, just let me know. Um, okay, so I'm moving to non coding, non -coding variation. Yes? Uh, do I understand correctly when you told about this uh, compensating mutation in uh, fish or in horse. Yeah. You said that they're not necessarily close in... Uh, in sequence. In structure, it's, it's a complicated business. We didn't have structure for the proteins. Mm -hmm. But at least if you look at the annotations, they are not in the same domain. So I'm pretty confident, like, like in this story, I'm pretty confident that I wouldn't be able to sit and design like within today's design method to predict it. We did try to use structures to find compensatory changes. It doesn't work very well, so I think there is a lot we don't understand about, about, about these effects. They are probably trends though. So, so the easiest way to think about it, like look, this is a receptor, right? That's classic G GPCR. We know how it works. We know that confirmation of this region is linked to confirmation of this region because this is how receptors transmit the signal. They are, they are divided by the cell membrane. So predicting it from simple contact or electrostatic interactions or something like that, this was the original idea. So, so then you, uh, I'm dating myself. 20 years ago when, when we computed and did this hemoglobin slide. So this hemoglobin slide is actually 20 years old. Um, uh, we, I believe personally that you can compute in a favorable energetic pairing and disfavorable energetic pairing in the structures, and I played with that quite a bit. Nothing got published because I never could get it work well enough. Uh, don't know why. So it seems to be a harder problem that that makes in the surface. Again, maybe in my hands. Maybe there are smarter people who can do it much better. Yeah? So, at these days, uh, I see many sort of perspectives on DMS data. They say that, okay, we can use DMS data as the grand truth to get rid of all, uh, all complications of the queen bar and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't believe that, by the way. Yeah, this is what I'm, I was going to say, because uh, in, in DMS, uh, you are only testing one aspect of function, right? However, in, you know, evolution is a process where there are many factors involved, selection process. So I, I would like to know your comment on that. Yeah, so, so this, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. So it's, um, uh, I uh, have a colleague who uh, became and left, uh, went to the dark side and became an important person in, in the pharma, in, in the industry. So he calls me once and he says, okay, so we're, we used to run the simulations for ray variant studies. And he's saying, okay, so shall we do, try to do DMS for every human protein? to run tests against every human phenotype in a large sequencing study and actually figure out every single drug target in the world. Are we powered enough to do this? Right? 
Running DMS for every human protein is a lot of money, so you have to think about this very like seriously. Uh, I think there are a bunch of issues. So one, what you mentioned, you measure one aspect of function. You never know whether you're localized to the right location, because function is a lot of things, right? It's, it's localization, it's stability, it's the proper binding. Sometimes you get some nonsense because uh, you lock antibody binding site and you get DMS data completely misleading uh, or, or any functional data completely misleading. So this is number one. Number two is noise. There's a lot of noise. And then, uh, even if you get the direction of the effect, what's interesting, right? So combinational methods is hard because with combinational method I don't know the scale, right? Here I know the scale. I know this is a large effect, this is a small effect. But that's at the molecular level how this scale is being transformed into phenotypic, right? So for example, this is MC4R. I think this is related to risk of diabetes and obesity, right? How is this effect translated into, into human BMI? Right, we don't know from DMS experiment. We, just there is zero, there is zero information. The last part, it's obviously context, it, it, it's, it's not in the nature of context. So there, uh, there are many issues. I, I, I would not trust DMS as standard of truth. I think current American College of Medical Genetics guidelines, you don't use it as standard of truth for, for pathogenic assessment. Uh, classically, uh, standard of truth comes from human genetics. Right? So, so if I see multiple the novel mutations of the same nucleotide with people with the same phenotype, I know this is real. If I have a variant segregating in multiple pedigrees uh, through multiple informative meiosis, I know this is real. I know human genetics tell me this, this is real. Um, if, if I see experimental evidence, it has to be contr uh, contrasted with the human genetic evidence. At least this is my take on that. Um, again, can you, uh, sorry, long answer, but one last comment. Uh, there are computational groups uh, now uh, suggesting that with some DMS data and some computational predictions, you can actually move the ROC to clinically actionable, uh, actionable guidelines. So you can be, for a tail, for a subset of, of very strong predictions, you can be as accurate as, as current clinical guidelines. Uh, and they try to identify the subset. And if numbers will work out, I think I'll probably support that. Um, the clean bar is hard because like, you realize what's happening, right? So you have, for example, new mutation of the BRCA gene, and a patient would, would, go, would under, uh, undergo very uh, traumatizing surgery. Right? You don't want this, to be, this decision to be based on an experiment with a lot of noise or on the computational prediction with like, some of these decisions are, are dead serious. Some are not. Okay, uh, shall we still move to non coding variants? Yes. Okay. Non coding variants. Um, so, uh, well, you probably know the gist of the story the human genome got sequenced, there are very few genes, a lot of non coding space. Uh, then you're looking at conservation of human species, you look at where, where common, uh, common disease uh, heritability resides, it's only in the variants, and potentially it resides in regulatory sequence. Again, I told you I'm not talking about splicing in this talk. I know splicing is important, but every time you're saying everything regulatory, people are asking what about splicing. I know splicing is important, I just, I'm not talking about it. Um, you have promoter sequences, you have uh, distal enhancer sequencers, you have insulators, you have, uh, you, uh, you have silencers, you have a whole bunch of different things, right? Um, so this is all regulatory machinery, and this is probably where the action is. How do we know this works for human genetics? We have very few examples where we know what's, what's happening, right? So one is this gene, uh, Okatu. Uh, it's an eye color gene. Eye color is not truly really Mendelian phenotype. But if you're a homozygote for OCA2 loss of, loss, loss of this enhancer function, 98% chance you, you, you have light eyes, and green or, or, or blue on the right? So it's a very large effect of you. This is one of the examples of human alleles that are non-disease and large effect. And this, this are, there are very few. 
by the way. In the human population, there are very few, because of natural selection and other forces we discussed, there are very few uh, variants that are large effect on our disease, and one of them happens to be this one, and we know that this is exact regulatory mutation, right? A very large effect. Another example of human non disease very large effect is lactase. Uh, and uh, lactase gene, right? Uh, the story goes that uh, before dairy farming, uh, grown up humans could not process uh, lactase. And then the, the regulatory mutation became very beneficial because it allows humans to consume uh, milk products with, with no problem and still. Uh, human population segregates this variant. Um, and this variant turns out to be non coding, and what's important is not even within the lactase gene, it's, it's in the intron of the neighboring gene. That's a distal enhancer variant. It's a large effect we're absolutely sure we'll not make it. So we know those things happen, but we know very little outside of this. Now, what we know, and I mentioned this, we now have a whole bunch uh, of mammals. In the Zoonomia Consortium, and on top of this, we have additional primate genomes uh, in the paper I just mentioned. This is 2023, the other paper 2023. All of those genomes just showed up. Like, we, we were, were literally starting analyzing those. Um, and if you do heritability partitioning, uh, now, what is heritability partitioning? Like, very quickly, we discussed that we believe in this normal distribution world of statistical genetics. Everything is about variance. Variance is decomposable. I can ask, I don't know where, where functional, because of LD, right? My, my problem is confusion. I don't know where my biologically significant variants responsible for high blood pressure, heart disease, where they are in the genome. So for any nucleotide, I don't know whether this is functional or not. Right? I can run whatever association studies, but because everything is correlated to everybody, right? I, I have no idea. But I can run a sophisticated model. I can say, or in this case, uh, like this people can, or Steven, Steven Gazal can, and other people I would, I would show uh, example of, of work. I can ask how much genetic variance is due to SNPs under this annotation. Turns out that if I look, at the distance, conservation with especially primates, what's interesting, especially within primates, explains a lot of signal for a lot of human disease. Right? So these are positions that are conserved or within conserved segments of the signals with every primate species. And this is what explains most of your genetics. That's the strongest signal we have. Attest to the power of evolution. Evolutionary genetics is great. The problem is I have no I have no way to interpret it. Right? I know it's concerned among primates. What in the world does the science do? I don't know from this. So the next observation is more directly functional. Uh, and this is the observation that a lot of these functional variants fall into regions of polychromatin. This is based on DNA's hypersensitivity assay. Uh, and those are regular really sequences. Now, uh, I'm a little bit confused about this because I, I know that every single regulatory sequence is, is open chromatin. Uh, a lot of people believe that every open chromatin mark uh, is a regulatory site. I, I don't know whether we know this, but, but there, is, there are some people who believe that. Uh, and there are chromatin modifications, right? So, so a lot of this epigenetic marks that, that, that mark regulatory elements. A lot of heritability seeds there. Now, this is the story how I was blocking progress of science. By 2012, uh, my co-writer Justin McDonald was calls me up and says, you know what, I, I'm looking at this GWAS peaks against our experimental DNA signals, and I'm finding that they line up. Uh, so our GWAS, our DNA signals explain GWAS signals. This is like 10 years ago. And I'm like, John, everybody can eyeball anything, right? So GWAS signals are correlated, uh, DNA uh, signals are correlated, everything is lining up with everything, and it's, it's, it's not really the case. So we, we, we figured this out. So this is the first one was Matt Morata. Now, I would show this. This is the most telling thing. Uh, how many people know what PRS duration is? Yeah, I see some people with medical background nodding, but not a lot. So, um, so PRS duration is when there is 
uh, EKG, right? So we're measuring electric function of heart. Uh, doctors are not very good with infinite dimensional objects, right? So the curve is infinite dimensional objects. So they give the curve the letters P, P, Q, R, S, whatever. And there is one duration. So this is a specifically heart phenotype. There is a genome wide association study. You look at positions at p values, enrichment of, of significant variance in relative regions, and you find them in heart, specifically in heart. And that, I think, is a very strong evidence that the signal is real. Right? You're actually guessing the right tissue. The effects are very small, there are very many variants, but they are all in regulatory regions, specifically in, in, in heart. If I look at multiple sclerosis, I get immune cells. If I look at Crohn's disease, I, I get immune cells, and this, this is what I expect. Uh, later work, my Alcus Price and Sasha Gusev, so this is here the immunity partitioning. They were pretty generous, but they are saying that 80% of all variation underlying human disease sits in open chromatin. So that's a regulatory, um, regulatory signal. Uh, this is more recently, again, heritability partitioning and conservation explains a lot. Coding, of course, is very rigid, but it's a small amount of real estate. Still, even in the joint model, chromatin and regulatory related features are, are quite rich. Uh, there is application of all of this. Right, people try to use this in ratios and fine mapping, try, trying to find what variants are truly biologically functional in this current model. Okay, I have the last segment. Uh, am I still okay in time, on time or not? Okay, okay, good. So, now there is this new idea that we can use molecular <laughs> phenotypes. And long-standing studies in the in the field were EQTLs. Uh, how many people know about EQTLs? Not a lot. I didn't include specific. Okay, some people know a little bit. Um, I didn't include specific slides, but then I'll try to hand wave about EQTLs. Right. When I'm running association study, I can run any phenotype. Uh, I can run heart disease. I can run diabetes. I can run transcription factor binding. I can run gene expression. So the idea is that if my variants are regulatory, that the variant that acts to changes of expression of certain gene, right, this genetic association should line up with genetic association where my phenotype is expression of the gene. So EQTL are expression QTLs. They are QTLs relevant to expression. Now this is the whole logic of, of the field, and then, and then I'll talk about our recent paper where we believe everything is much more complicated than what other people think. So the, the idea is this. Um, I have a gene loss peak. So the original idea was that I have to find out what's happening. I should move into control model system, fish, mouse, this whatever, cell, cell culture. And then move to biochemistry and figure out what was the biology. Right. That's a very difficult proposition because Imagine you have a region of 150 kb where you change height by 0.1 millimeter, and you're saying, let's do experiments on this. Like, what kind of experiments are you going to do? Or, so then there was this idea that I used to call human genetics all the way. And the idea is that you measure phenotypes at the molecular level. So I have GWAS peak, and then I measure some of the phenotypes. And for example, I measure something at the cell level. And then I measure gene expression as another phenotype. And then I measure, for example, methylation or transcription factor binding site. So if I see that my association signal for molecular QTL coincides with my association signal for expression QTL with endophenotype and then with GWASP, this is much more tractable. I can bring this to experimental lab because I know which gene expression is controlled, how it's controlled, how it's presented in the cell system, right? So this is something I can work with. Now the problem is that, that I think that my genotype causes expression or endophenotype and causes phenotype. But because of LZ, I can have two different signals. One causes endophenotype, one causes phenotype, and they are in correlation. So I have to figure out what to do. So this poses the problem which is called colocalization. So this is what's happening. This is some, some computer simulation, some tuned in the level of time ago related to a specific method, that's not very important. What's important is that I'm looking at one trait. For example, it's a disease trait, right? And all of these guys are significantly associated. I don't know which one. 
the, in this simulation, this is a true cause invariant. I don't know that this is a true cause invariant. And this is another phenotype, for example, gene expression. This is the association. And again, in this case, for example, this is correct cause invariant. Now I don't know about it. But what I can do, I can develop statistical machinery to test by, by looking at the joint distribution of the effect sizes and linking to the equilibrium. I can test whether there is the same cause invariant that drives both of this or not. Okay, so I can colocalize the peaks. And there are different methods called Oki Caviar, we developed JLIM at some point, again, some children in the lab, in, in the lab when he was in the lab developed it. Uh, is, I think, is the most popular method right now. Okay, so we try to test how this works because this is a hobby horse. And the way we did it, we looked at complex trait variants uh, in genes that have large Mendelian components. So I have to know which genes are truly causing disease, right? And for example, I have monogenic version of diabetes, and I have a GWAS peak for, for diabetes. I have a monogenic version of, of uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease for a specific gene. I have polygenic peak there. We redeem all genome-wide uh, associations. That is removing coding variation. So we know that mostly Mendelian variation is, is, is coding, and we will be to it. Again, the model is that I, I come to the right gene using coding variation, and I'm trying to test the non-coding variation expression. So the hypothesis is uh, that uh, there will be changes in gene expression for genes which I know are involved in the trade and have peaks around them in the non-coding region. So these genes include, for example, we I discussed a lot of LDL receptor. So LDL receptor. If I exclude the coding region, it has a massive non-coding peak in association with LDL. If I run genetic association with LDL, I find LDL receptor under the peak. I bet my money that this is the gene, right? So the, the LDL, there are multiple genes maybe under the peak, but I believe LDL receptor drive the peaks. Uh, I see, for example, breast cancer association in a study. Estrogen receptor is under one of the peaks. I believe estrogen receptor drives, drives association with breast cancer. So that's the logic. So we ran colocalization methods, three of them, transcriptome-wide association studies, TWAS, it's a confusion, and analysis of chromatin marks. Uh, that I probably chromatin marks work to some degree. It's, it's just hard to find the right gene. Um, and we just look at the closest gene to the peak. Uh, so again, colocalization between GWAS and gene expression, right? So there are multiple genes in the locus. We're saying this is correct because its shapes of the group is the same. It's much more complicated than shape of the peak, but I'm kind of glossing this over. And you can run just genetic correlation to the locus. It's called transcription-wide association study between the gene and the expression. This doesn't really correct for LD, but this corrects for the possibility of multiple variants in the locus, and generally has high power. So the issue is, what's happening is, is, is very bizarre. So I have the genes that I believe are included in disease. These are found by rare variant burden testing. These are Mendelian components. Most of them have non-coding associations. Very few of this have any evidence of express, changes of expression of the right gene. I really don't know why. I mean, this is very bizarre because we know the genes are regulatory and they don't colocalize with expressions of the correct genes. Chromatin is doing actually quite a bit better, but it's very hard to find the right gene using chromatin because I just know that there's chromatin association peak. Uh, this is the full table, right? So these are three colocalization methods. So mostly uh, these are the classes of the genes. This is whether it's a QTL or not. There is a QTL in the region. And then whether this colocalizes and the last column is chromatin. And most of them don't. Uh, okay, so why? Is it because we're not looking at the right cell type? Maybe we're not looking at the right context. We brought to the gene through coding variant, it's not context specific, but maybe expression regulator is, is, is interesting. Maybe it's about certain developmental stage, maybe certain environmental condition. Uh, or maybe there is a uh, nonlinear relationship, so what we're measuring measuring total amount of the message and, and it 
But the effect is on the rate of transcription, right? So if there is no linearity built in, maybe this propagates. So the other thing, we call them red herring in QT. Sorry, it's, it's, it's an American expression. I don't know if people know it. And so, so we do have a QTL. So what's surprising is I do have a variant that changes expression on the right gene. It just doesn't change the, the phenotype. Another variant does. So what we're doing right now, and uh, yes, there are multiple papers also questioning the QTL part of it here. Uh, and um, we have to get out of this. So one way to get out of this, I promised one of you two single cell slides at the end of my like this are two last slides, but they are single cell because I, I specifically promised to include them. So this is the paper by um, uh, uh, Nathan et al. Uh, from uh, uh, Shanghai lab. And what they look at, they are finding these interactions between positions. So this is single cell UMAP. And you're saying, oh, there are SNPs that are EQTLs uh, interacting with position of the cell in the transcription map. Right? So here there is the effect, and here there is no effect. So it may be that specific groups of cells uh, is responsible for the expression change. So Jonathan Mitchell in my lab, he developed a new method looking at um, association by going through, uh, this is specific for autoimmune diseases, this is rheumatoid arthritis association, and uh, this is the G. and locus, and you see exactly the same peak, but only in this group of cells. Now there are many questions, I'm not sure these groups of cells make sense biologically, but we find the statistical subsets of cells that show uh, that genetic control of expression correlates with the effect of the phenotype. Still not a lot of them, we're finding more, uh, and I'm not sure that what we're finding is correct. This is again, this is very early work. But this is where we're moving, so the, the whole idea that the simple, simple analysis of regulatory function didn't work in our hands. I, I, yeah. Again, EQTLs are great, right? I don't see any other, I don't have any other biological hypothesis. But we probably have to chase a kind of specificity and we probably should move to, to this multidimensional spaces of single cell data. Because uh, we're amazing today. This is my last slide. Mm -hmm.